question and introduce you to uh, Jeffrey Taft. He's got a PhD in electrical engineering. He's the global smart grid solution architect for Accenture. He's been uh, working in electric power since 1995 in the smart grid since 2001. He's responsible for um, all the Accenture smart grid architecture, methodologies, solution sets. Very uh, bright guy and very expert in this uh, data management field. Just in getting ready for this webinar, I've learned a ton from Jeffrey, and I know you will, too. Jeffrey, would you take us through? All right, very good. Thank you. And welcome, everyone. The interesting thing about smart grid is I think that the very thing that makes the grid smart is also the thing that creates a lot of the headaches that we have to deal with. We know that many people who are looking at smart grid are very concerned about the problem of how to manage all of the new data that can arise from the grid. And in fact, that's the thing that we have been focused on for quite a while. You'll see different estimates of how much that data is going to expand. Um, some people look at the meter data and look at the expansion of that. We've looked at meter data plus many other kinds of data. That's why we have a sense of you know, many orders of magnitude increase in the data. And honestly, in my opinion, one of the things that we're going to see ultimately is that we're going to get more data from other parts of the smart grid and other devices than we will from the meter system, even though we're going to go through a massive expansion of meter data as well. So our point of view about that is that it supports multiple business processes if we use it properly. And when we look at the problem of managing the data coming from the smart grid, the new data, we think about it in terms of five big stages just to break it down into pieces that are more manageable. And I think these stages are probably pretty familiar to a lot of people. But we use this to really help us understand how to architect solutions for data management. So from the bottom up, we think about data generation. In other words, all the things that are going to generate data from the smart grid, line sensors, meters, grid devices, um, field, mobile field force, uh, substations. There are lots and lots of pieces that can produce new data. Not every smart grid has the same set, but every smart grid has the same problem, making use of all the data that it does produce. We Jeffrey, have this, is just, je, this is Jesse, just to, to confirm here. These are the five stages, and you're saying generally it starts at the bottom and works up? Am I understanding well, that correctly? Well, I, I just started at the bottom and worked my way up for purposes of explaining this. These are all stages we have to work through to develop a solution architecture. The order in which you do them doesn't have to be necessarily this way, but from my standpoint, this is kind of a logical hierarchy. So good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, so we think about uh, generation, then transport, and then persistence, which really means data storage and opens up the questions of how are we going to represent the data and how should we persist it for different kinds of applications. Transformation, which is you know, we use analytics, basically software tools, to transform raw data into useful information uh, so that it can be comprehended. And we combine that with visualization for decision support. And then finally, integration, meaning we have to connect all this information to utility processes and systems in order to get real value out of it. So we tend to think about those five stages as part of our framework for how we're going to put together a data management solution for a smart grid. We also think about five classes of smart grid data. And uh, three of these classes are quite familiar, the first three. Operational data, which is largely the kind of data you sort of associate with SCADA. Um, Non-operational data, which is asset monitoring data for the most part. And meter usage data, all very familiar to most people who work with utilities. In addition, there are two more classes that haven't gotten as much attention but are quite important in the smart grid environment. Event message data uh, is a really big one. And as we put more smart devices on the grid, we have more and more instances where we see these devices are able to generate asynchronous event messages. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of times we get those messages in big bursts that we have to process with low latency, in other words, pretty fast. We need some special tools to do that. We're going to talk about that more. And then metadata, which is all this ancillary information we have to keep track of to be able to use everything else. So and we give an do example, think about the characteristics. Would you, uh, Jeffrey, just give an example of uh, metadata? Yeah, one of the really important pieces of metadata is connectivity information. Uh, other uh, examples include things like network addresses, calibration constants. They're just a whole bunch of pieces of information that we have to keep track of to make the smart grid function. Uh, 
And without that, it's pretty easy for something to break down because we have perhaps hardwired it a network address which has been changed, for example. Managing the metadata for a smart grid is a pretty challenging problem and one that hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the literature. So once we recognize that, there are some pretty big challenges for data management. Uh, one of them is matching the data acquisition infrastructure to required outcomes. That sounds a little abstract, but it has a big impact on business case. Um, there are a couple of ways to view this. One way is to say, I'd like to minimize the amount of sensing in infrastructure I have to have to generate a particular set of business outcomes. Or I've got a set of infrastructure and I want to know what are all the benefits I can generate from that data. Either way, this has an impact on your business case and we sort of think this through in a pretty logical fashion. Um, another challenge for the utility is learning to apply some new tools, new standards, and new architectures to manage grid data at full scale. So, you know, NIST has a stack of standards that they have been promoting for smart grid. Um, there are issues about interoperability. There are also issues around distributed architecture and new kinds of analytics tools that utility has to think about mastering in order to be able to handle the, the data management problem for smart grids. Jeffrey, may I just jump in one quick moment? May I jump in yeah. just one quick moment? Because we did have a, a question on the web about uh, the mm -hmm. NIST's role. And we're here today to talk about you know, data management in particular. You did mention it in passing. What is their role going to be about some of these uh, data nomenclature and other standards issues here? Well, you know, NIST is focused to a large extent on uh, developing a view about the set of standards that should apply to smart grid designs. Very valuable functionality. Standards are incredibly important in this area. Um, standards are necessary, in fact, for all this to work. Standards are not sufficient, and by that mean, I mean you need more than standards. But the standards work is incredibly important, and in North America, especially in the U.S., NIST is playing a leading role there. For those of you who are outside the U.S., there are other standards bodies to be aware of as well. But the things that they are doing are incredibly important because we have many different systems that have to interoperate. Without those standards, we have chaos. Okay, thank you. So the last thing is transforming business processes to take advantage of smart grid. Very important because that's the way that you get value out of your smart grid solutions. So you have to think about that transformation of business processes. Now, like a lot of organizations, we have a methodical approach to doing smart grid design. This is one from Accenture, and I'm not going to try to go through every single block here, but I want to point out a couple of things about this. Most of the steps that you see here would be familiar to anyone who has done system design, except that we have integrated a lot of specific smart grid knowledge and experience into our process steps. I just want to point out two in particular that would not be as familiar to most folks. One that you see on here is called observability strategy. And that goes back to the issue I mentioned a minute ago, where we talked about thinking about minimizing the sensing infrastructure and maximizing the business benefits from the information that you get through them. That process, we think, deserves an extra little bit of attention, so we've actually made a formal step to think about exactly how many sensors, what kind, where should they be, how are we going to process the data, how many different outcomes can we get from that set of sensors as a strategic element of figuring out how we're going to design the, the architecture. That leads to a sensor architecture that ties in with the other pieces. And, and then Jeffrey, the when you say you're, you're going to minimize, are you minimizing the number of sensors or minimizing the amount of data that you decide to pull from them or some combination? Well, we'd like to minimize the, the cost of that infrastructure wherever possible. And that can mean uh, not, it may not actually result in a minimum number of devices. It may actually result in a larger number of less expensive devices or alternately a smaller number of more expensive devices. But the real goal is minimize the overall cost while maximizing the value of the benefits. It's a non-trivial optimization problem and it's one that's not easily solved in a formal mathematical sense but we have some guidelines and experience to show us how to get better solutions than just doing the normal siloized approach where you put out one kind of sensing technology for one thing and another kind for another thing and end up with too many different kinds of sensing devices out there. 